social media accounts. Uh, so you might. Oh, thank you. Sorry, it'll take a while. No, it's, it's fine. It's kind of slow. I'm lucky. Yeah. It's <laughs> Um, so like Leanne said, I, I work with her in marketing and communications, and we're doing all sorts of fun stuff right now. I kind of got to the account. You guys got <laughs> Yes, that's me. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, Ryan, so much notoriety. <laughs> <laughs> Secretly famous. I, I find it entertaining, so I'm glad other people enjoy it. There we go. Awesome. All right. And at, at any time, if you have questions, just shout out at me and I'll try to answer them. If I don't know, I'll tell you I don't know. Okay. All right. So just before, sort of like a brief little history here. Not too dark. No, that's good. Uh, Missouri was admitted to the Union in 1821, so we've been around almost as long as the state. A clause written into our our sort of stateship said that the part of the money to founding the state would be used for a seminary of learning. Uh, the land was sold in the 1830s, and when the endowment reached $100,000, the legislature, legislature established a university. Uh, six counties were allowed to compete for the honor of hosting the state's university. Uh, north of the river was Boone, Callaway, and Howard. South was Cole, Cooper, and Saline. And it was sort of a contest. Whoever was able to raise the most money would get the university. Uh, the Geyer Act was introduced by Henry Geyer of St. Louis, which set up a fund from the proceeds of land sales and invested authority in a board of curators. So the board of curators, um, same group that, well, not the same people, but the same group has been around uh, basically from the start here. Our founding happened on February 11, 1839, when 900 citizens of Boone County pledged $117,000 in cash and land. Um, there was a little controversy at the time, not a lot, but just saying it. Some people said that land in Boone County was valued higher than its actual value was to win the bid, but Boone County did win the bid and the university was built here in Columbia. The University of Missouri was the first west of the Mississippi River in Thomas Jefferson's Louisiana Purchase Territory. So it was sort of a, a landmark institution as far as that goes. Our first president was John Hiram Lathrop. Uh, you guys might know Lathrop Paul, named after him. Uh, classes began in April that, that year, 1841. Our first academic building was Academic Hall. Um, you know the columns that were outside of it, made out of limestone. It was built between 1840 and 1843 uh, from the claims of an architect named uh, A. Stephen Hill, uh, who designed the Capitol in St. Louis, or in St. Charles, not St. Louis. Uh, so both of his, his big buildings have burned down. Uh, the red brick was fired on campus, and the limestone was from the Hinkson Creek Valley, which is just back down in that sort of creek valley down uh, behind where Mizzou Arena is now. So that's where the, the limestone from the columns came from. This is what the building looked like when it was originally constructed. Those are the columns there. And this would be if you are like on Elm Street almost, facing uh, south. So the building was on the north side of the columns. This is an inside look at one of the reading rooms inside of Academic Hall. It was uh, really big and spacious, a lot of woodwork. Um, and it kind of gives you a scale of just kind of how, how grand everything was in there. Our first graduates, that's, that's not what he looked like when he graduated. <laughs> um, but our first graduates were cousins named Big Bob and Little Bob Todd. They were both Robert Todd. Uh, Big Bob went on to be a Supreme Court Justice in the uh, state of Louisiana. And Little Bob was a really uh, influential person in our history. He was our first official tutor, spent 15 years as a curator, uh, 25 years as a secretary to the board, and was instrumental in creating the Alumni Association. Later on was a president, and I've got another fun fact about him in a second. Uh, in the Civil War, we suspended operations in 1862. Academic Hall was kind of uh, occupied by both sides during the war. Uh, the President's House was used to, uh, to house federal officers. Uh, the Normal School, which was the precursor to the College of Education, it was the Teachers College, uh, was an Army hospital. And Little Bob, this picture you saw right back here, Little Bob used his connection to save the university. 
Um, as, as far as legend goes, there is no official confirmation. A lot of the details can be confirmed, but this specifically came out. Um, uh, uh, the union was ordered to come in and destroy the city, basically, to put it to the flames because it was so much trouble. It kept changing hands, and they just wanted to be done with the trouble, so they're going to burn the city to the ground. And Little Bob uh, contacted his first cousin, Mary Todd Lincoln, President Lincoln's wife, uh, to, to save the city. And again, it's, it's quite possible that that did not happen, but that's the legend, and all of the supporting details are true, so it's a fun story. It might be real. <laughs> And again, some of those, those older stories are, are difficult to prove one way or the other, so if you present them as a fun story, it could be true. It could not be true, but there's just no way of knowing anymore. Uh, this is just sort of you, so you have a scale. These are soldiers a little later on, um, one of our military drilling units outside of Academic Hall. So that just kind of shows you how big the building actually was. So funding, uh, in 1867, the Missouri General Assembly began providing their annual allotment to the university. Um, the residence on Francis Quadrangle was built using that money. Uh, the president's house was just completely torn apart by all the, uh, the soldiers. Um, it cost $8,000 to build at the time, and the federal government provided that funding as sort of an IOU for housing the soldiers during the war. Uh, this is what it looked like pretty soon after the war there. This is Academic Hall here in the middle, the President's House off here to the left. Um, I believe this is the observatory, but that actually was down here. This is an artist's rendering. A lot of times the people they commissioned weren't actually at the location where they did the artwork go. And the stables at the time were off over here where the Academic Support Center is now. If you notice that building kind of looks strange kind of down there. It's essentially a converted stable. So the first females were admitted to Mizzou not long after. They were first allowed entrance in 1867, but weren't actually admitted until 1868, and that was to the normal school, the teacher's college. Uh, it was called a bold and hazardous undertaking at the time. Uh, Mary Louise Gillette, uh, who was our first female graduate, uh, Gillette Hall, named after her, uh, graduated in 1870. Uh, they, they figured out that allowing women in wasn't a terrible thing after all in 1871, and they started allowing women in all classes after that. Our first uh, female graduates were Sarah Ware, Helen Packer, and Richard Seward uh, in 1872, so not long after that. The Morrill Act in 1870 established the land-grant colleges across the, the country. A lot of these institutions, like you know, might know Michigan and Michigan State or Kansas and Kansas State, um, established both a research and a land grant institution. Mizzou is unique in the fact that we have both in one university. Um, whereas a lot of these other places, like Texas, Texas A&M, A&M stands for Agriculture and Mines. Um, we established the mines in metallurgy and raw, and we kept agriculture here on campus with a lot of politicking. So we were, we were very, I don't want to say very unique because that's wrong, but we were individual in the fact that nobody else was really doing it this way. Uh, in 1872, we started awarding professional degrees. The Department of Law was founded in the medical department, which started in 1845, became the School of Medicine. Um, this is kind of an early shot of one of the laboratories that medicine used. You can just see on the bottom slide. In 1873, athletics began, and we competed in our first intercollegiate activity in a baseball game against Westminster, which we lost. Uh, set up a proud tradition of losing sports contests. But uh, they tried. In 1873, uh, I don't know if you guys are the wine fans yet or not, but uh, we were very instrumental in saving the wine industry. Uh, Charles Riley, a lecturer and the state entomologist, uh, grafted, the French wine industry was being ravaged by a type of aphid that was resistant to um, a lot of the treatments that the French had. So they grafted uh, the French uh, vines onto Missouri rootstock, which was resistant to these aphids and really uh, saved the entire French wine industry. 
Our first female dean was Grace Bibb, and she was the dean of the College of Normal Instruction, uh, now the College of Education, in 1878. Thomas Jefferson, uh, his tombstone that was received from his ears, came here in 1883. It was just recently uh, kind of refurbished by the Smithsonian and is on display over at the Missouri Theater right now, and usually will be at Jesse Hall, just in the rotunda downstairs. Um, the Francis Quadrangle was fashioned after uh, Thomas Jefferson, John Thomas Jefferson's University of Virginia, where he's credited as being the father of the university. Um, so it's, it's sort of a, a nod to that, as us being the first university in Thomas Jefferson's Louisiana State, or Louisiana Purchase Territory. I'm sorry, I'm bumping all of my words tonight. It's been a long week. Um, because it was modeled after that, the university was awarded this tombstone and was sort of modeled for him after our rebuilding. Football started in 1890. We played our first game against Wash U in St. Louis on Thanksgiving Day, which we lost. Uh, I do not remember offhand, but I know it. they've got it online on our athletics website, so you can go and look at that. Uh, the name, they called the Team Tigers after their group of citizens here in Columbia who prevented any large-scale attacks from Confederate bushwhackers by fortifying uh, downtown. If you've ever been down on, I don't remember, Walnut or Ash, the YMCA down there was the artillery and City Hall. They kind of fortified around that area whenever there were threats. And Which one is it, Liam? Ash. Ash, okay. I knew it was one of the two. Uh, but they kind of fortified that little area. They were said to be as fierce as tigers, and so that's where the, the nickname Tigers came from. Uh, in doing a lot of research about the mascot and the history, there's, there's been some controversy over whether our colors have always been black and gold or whether they were crimson and gold originally. Um, I've looked at a lot of microfilm and I haven't found anything definitive one way or the other. There have been things that have said both. Uh, but if you ever look at any of the university elements that are designed, you can see little accents of red, like the Mizzou plaid has the red in it. Um, it's just sort of a little nod to the fact that it might have been our, one of our original colors. This is what the first football team looked like here. Uh, the uniforms were not uniform at all. It was a lot of times just what people had, and they sewed letters onto the front of them. The MSU uh, that you can see on the front of this guy's jersey here was another just really common way of referring to us. We were Missouri State University. Um, which I don't know if you guys are old enough to remember, but there was a big battle not too long ago over whether Southwest Missouri State could change their name to Missouri State, and that's where it came from because it was our historical name. But we lost that battle and we moved on. So uh, the Kansas rivalry started in 1891. The Tigers and Jayhawks first played in the football game on Halloween that year. In 1905, the alumni magazine called it the social event basically of the year and is, was the big money maker as far as both athletic departments were concerned. Uh, it was the oldest football rivalry west of the Mississippi River and the second most played rivalry nationally. At the time, the, when it started, they awarded an old Indian drum to the winner and they realized maybe that was offensive uh, and changed it to a bass drum trophy later on. So here's just kind of a gist of what it looked like. The head changed with logos over the years. Um, the bass drum, that was after, I think, 2008's win. And these were old. They used to play the games on Thanksgiving, so they'd have different invitations that everyone would send out each year. And Thanksgiving themed, I like the turkey with the football, so I put that one there. Uh, the big fire, 1892. Faulty wiring started the, the fire in Academic Hall. There is a fake rumor that it was the first incandescent light bulb west of the Mississippi. Uh, that was not true. But uh, it was poor wiring inside of Academic Hall. Uh, and as you could see in one of those early pictures, Academic Hall was a really, really big building. And there was no fire department or fire hydrants or anything like that at the time. So putting out a place in something that large was, was pretty impossible. So uh, as soon as the, the word about the fire started spreading, people from the town, students, faculty, all came in to try to save pieces of our history because everything was in that one building. Um, so some books, documents, um, Emperor the Elephant. Have you guys ever heard about Emperor? All right, Emperor is one of my favorite stories. 
Uh, Emperor was this gigantic elephant who was, well, he, he started off in the Barnum and Bailey's circus. Um, he killed a few people in New York, actually. He stampeded at the circus there. He died at a circus in Liberty. So Samuel Laws, our president at the time, purchased Emperor. And because Emperor was, it was a gigantic elephant. It's not cheap to transport this elephant to be taxidermied and brought back for the zoology department. They collected a couple other animals at the time, tigers and cheetah, and I think there was some other weird, I think there was like a giant boar also or something like that. But they, collect, they collected a bunch of taxidermied animals and Emperor was gonna be like the showcase in the middle of it all. And he was going to pay for it uh, he got approval for the other animals, did not get approval for Emperor to be purchased. So he was going to use investments from real estate. He had a lot of real estate investments in the Kansas City area to pay for this. Well, over the course of a couple of years, while it was being taxidermied and then shipped back to Columbia from New York via railroad, um, a lot of his investments went bad in Kansas City, and he was unable to pay for the taxidermy. So instead, he forwarded the bill, which was about $20,000 in today's money. Uh, to the Board of Curators to pay for it because he couldn't. And the state's government at the time was outraged by this, this misappropriation of funds and forced him to resign. Uh, Governor David Francis at the time forced Samuel Laws out. Anyway, Emperor later was this sort of symbol of greatness and a boondoggle and just a very central figure to people's lives and academic all. Anyway, they were able to rescue Emperor by smashing up the sides of the wall. Of, of one of the buildings with sledgehammers and dragged his court, well, carcass out there into the snow. Uh, the, the resolve of the community after the fire was really strong. The, it happened on a Saturday night. By Tuesday morning, they had already had meeting spaces for all the classes again. And in three days, they had approved a campus plan that sort of outlined the current quad. Um, this is a picture of what the fire was like. And saving the columns is also a pretty good story. Um, Gideon Rothwell, uh, who's got several things named for him here in town, was president of the board at the time, and was just going to tear them down because this was not part of their, their big plan to replace all of the buildings. Locals and alumni, kind of led by a guy named Jerry Dorsey, were like, no, this is a symbol of our, our resolve, our will to rebuild. Um, you're not taking these down. Uh, the line about a herd of elephants couldn't tear him down was a direct shot at the university's administration who did end up paying for that elephant. Uh, then they said they were going to dynamite him down. The two fought, like actual, like got in a fist fight out on the quad. Uh, Dorsey got an injunction the same day as the fight to make sure that they were not torn down. Uh, they brought in an architect to declare the column structurally sound with a little bit of reinforcement. And with a speech from Samuel Laws before the board, he came back to say what a great uh, icon these columns are for us. And it changed, uh, led to a change of heart from Rothwell on the board. And afterward, he said the famous line, let the columns stand, let them stand a thousand years. Uh, so this is kind of a group here. I could not tell you specifically who Dorsey was in this photo, but it's a group of locals and alumni who were instrumental in keeping the columns. So that's just kind of what they looked like after the fire. Yeah? What are they reinforcing? There's um, a lot of cement work, kind of in stonework beneath the ground. Um, over the years, it's not as obvious now, but there was a big hump in the ground, like leading up to the columns. They've leveled it off over the years to drain better. Um, but they've, they've like rooted them down into the ground pretty well. Uh, so the deal to keep Mizzou in Columbia, after the fire, a lot of members of the state's General Assembly tried to move the university. Uh, Governor David Francis uh, was very much a leader in the, the effort to keep them here in town. He cut a deal. Their sort of idea was to move the, the university to Sedalia. But we made the deal where Sedalia would get to keep the state fair every year in exchange for keeping the university in Columbia. Uh, we, we got the better end of, of that deal. The state fair was a lot bigger deal back then. Um, 
So we, we definitely lucked out with that one. And in honor of uh, David R. Francis, the Clark Wrangler is named in his honor today. And this superstition, I'm not sure if you guys have rubbed his nose for good luck, but a lot of people have. It's supposed to bring people good luck on tests if they rub his nose. Because it's been so popular, we are on his third nose. Uh, the new academic hall opened June 4th, 1895. Uh, it was not named Jesse Hall until 1922. Uh, Richard Henry Jesse was the president of the university at the time of the fire, and it was named in his honor. Um, I don't know if you guys can see that very well, but up top there's a little ball that's on the top of it. Um, it's one of the honor or secret societies here uh, uses that, I guess, kind of as a logo. It snapped off the top of Jesse uh, when somebody tied a flag to it. People used to sneak up on top of the buildings a lot, and that was one of them. They tied a flag to it, and on a really windy day, it just snapped off. So it has not been on there since. Uh, just a little piece of trivia, the dome of Jesse Hall would be taller than the building if it were standing next to it. It's 105 feet tall. In 1900, we had just surpassed 1,000 students. Uh, we had a few from around the world, but again, it was mostly the state of Missouri. And in 1901, Parker Hospital opened up, which provided a really good medical education. It was a learning hospital. And as you can kind of see here, this little circular area on the building, which is the uh, east side of the building, was an instructional lab. Students would be around this ring up at the top while surgery or operations were going on down below, and that allowed students to kind of look down into what was going on around them and really see what was happening. And Park Parker is uh, still over there. It's, um, if you follow the path off of the quad at the northwest corner, it just kind of loops back over that way before you get to 6th Street. Okay, so becoming the zoo. Uh, this has been an ongoing project of mine, uh, is to find the first recorded use of the word Mizzou. I've traced it back as far as 1901 now. Um, originally we had it as 1906, so I've kind of been piecing it back year by year. Um, if any of you have a real interest in history and would like a project, I'd definitely welcome your help going through microfilm. Um, but the chant originated uh, when, when people at sporting contests or campus events would use a cheer called Mizzou Ra Ra. Um, they called it a train chant actually at the time. They would um, kind of move around Mizzou Ra Ra, Mizzou Ra Ra, but they would also be like MSU, as I showed you earlier with the football uniforms, so it was Mizzou, Mizzou, and it would just get faster and faster. And so people would just call it Mizzou. And that's where it originated. I do not know what year, officially but it was early, as early as 1901. Uh, basketball debuted in 1907. The team formed in 1906. They just didn't play any contests until then. They also lost their first game. Uh, <laughs> in 1908, we were invited to join the Association of American Universities, the AAU. Uh, we're one of only 34 public institutions in the country who are a member of the AAU. And only 13 universities have been members longer. The only people longer are part like Harvard, Yale, Stanford, um, like the real, real, like elite universities. So we're in pretty good company there. Uh, the School of Journalism was founded in 1908. Uh, Walter Williams, who was the editor of a defunct paper now, the Columbia Herald, uh, who was also a member of the Board of Curators, was named the dean. He would later go on to be the president of the university. Um, very beloved man in his time here, did a lot really to enhance our reputation, form a lot of journalism organizations. And the Missourian debuted on the first day of class that, that fall in 1908. Here's what that first issue looked like. The, my favorite headline is, The Man Sees Through Eyes of a Rabbit. Uh, they had a lot of good news. Uh, this is what the printing presses looked like back then. And this is what one of the classrooms was like over there with the, the typewriters. Uh, as another point of debate, uh, the history of homecoming, 
1911, Chester Brewer invited all night to come home for the MUK evening. More than 9,000 people came to Rollins Field, which is over where Stankowski is now. There's a little uh, plaque in the ground. Um, Jeopardy and Trivial Pursuit recognize us as the, the home of homecoming, so I think that works for me. In 1915, the library opened. It was called the Main Library. And so in 1972, it was named for Elmer Ellis, who was our 20, or I think he was our 22nd president. And, no, that's not right. I'm sorry. He's, I, it's the 17th or 18th. And the first president of the system when we became the UM system in 1963. Uh, one of our alumni was very influential in astronomy. His name was Harlow Shapley. Uh, he argued that the sun was not at the center of the galaxy, but off to the edge. And his model of the Milky Way really led to the first realistic estimate of what the galaxy was like. Uh, in 1918, the flu pandemic struck Columbia. It was actually killing people at the time, so campus shut down for three weeks. 1921, the shack. Well, it was a David T. Room at the time. It was a truck camper, made its way from San Diego, and was parked over across from where Jesse is now. Um, the Beetle, where Beetle Bailey's little statue is, is where the shack stood. In 1932, it was renamed and became a very popular hangout for the next four, five decades, really, uh, until it was destroyed by arson in 1988. There was never anyone arrested for it. Lots of people like to claim that they had a part in burning it down, or knew someone who did, or the university ordered them to do it, or they were on campus facilities. And there's a lot of people who like to claim some role in it. Again, it's one of those things that because so many people like to claim having some role in it, we don't know who ever officially actually did it. Uh, in 1922, we began fundraising to honor the 116 Missouri students who died in World War I. The way they chose to do this was a new student union and a new football stadium. Uh, in 1926, Memorial Union Tower was dedicated on homecoming day. Uh, it was about 140 feet tall, and it stood alone until 1952. Uh, they originally had plans to build the north and the south wing onto it, but the construction was delayed because of um, how hard a lot of people were hit by the uh, Great Depression. So eventually, the, uh, the South Wing, the North Wing was finished in 1952 and the South Wing in 63. Uh, and Memorial Union, or Memorial Stadium, the football stadium was constructed with a 25,000 seat capacity uh, that same year. And this is what the dedication of the tower looked like. And this is what Memorial Stadium looked like when it first opened, but just for that first year. They built in the ground and the rock end that next, that next year, 1927. Uh, in the 50s, pranksters changed the M to an N before the Nebraska game. They brought these rocks down and just made a, a nice big N there on the field. But one of the groundskeeper uh, rallied a bunch of students who were able to fix it before kickoff of the game. Mike, do you know the original capacity? The original capacity was 25,000. <laughs> yeah, uh, so they, they filled that out, and I don't know what year people started sitting on the hill, uh, but eventually they did that, open that up to, to the GA seating. The stadium track was around the field here. They used to, as halftime entertainment, have track meets that finished in the stadium. So you'd be watching the game, and you'd see people come running in on the track to finish a cross-country meet or things like that. So it was, a lot of entertainment, really. Uh, Don Ferro became our coach in 1934, it's who the field itself is named after. He created the famous split T formation while coaching in Mizzou. He coached until 1956 and stopped to serve in World War II. Uh, he took a break in the middle of that coaching span, 34 to 56, to serve in World War II. Uh, he compiled a record of 101 to 79, which made him the winningest coach in Mizzou history until Gary Pinkle took that from him uh, about a year ago. Uh, in 1936 was one of our more shameful points in history, but it's an important one. Lloyd Gaines and three Lincoln University students applied for admission to our law school, but were denied because of their race. 
The university offered to pay to send them elsewhere, uh, but they sued and the case made it to the United States Supreme Court in 1938. The case was Gaines v. Canada. The Supreme Court ruled in his favor, saying under the separate but equal doctrine, the university had to admit the students or create another law school for um, other black students to attend. Um, and the university, again, not doing the right thing, chose to what was a very uh, low move, tried to create a former cosmetology school in St. Louis to a law school. While this was going on, uh, Lloyd Gaines and the others needed money, obviously, to live. Traveled the country speaking to different NAACP groups and other uh, meetings in, in Chicago. In March of 1939, he disappeared. And nobody knows what happened to him, but it's just assumed that he was probably lynched. Uh, in 1945, William Albrecht collected a soil sample from San Juan Field that became sort of the precursor to penicillin. If you were sick with something, they gave you a rheumycin. Uh, later on, it would be penicillin. But in 1965, Sanborn was de dedicated as a registered historic landmark. Um, and the field actually opened as the Ag Experimentation Station in 1888. In 1947, we had a really big boom in enrollment because uh, a lot of Americans were coming back to school thanks to the GI Bill. Um, our enrollment went from about 1,500 students during the war to more than 11,000 in 1947. So um, they were just converting anything and everything. There were old grain silos that were converted. There were hangars, like airplane hangars, converted. There were tents basically just set up everywhere to to try to meet the demand of all the students. In 1948, Mort Walker uh, created his famous character, Beetle Bailey, while in the zoo. Uh, his, he spent a lot of time over at the shack, and it's said to be sort of the inspiration for Beetle Bailey. Uh, the strip was first published in 1950. The statue in front of Reynolds Alumni Center depicts him in one of the booths, and now you guys have the nice uh, sort of feature of showing people a lot of those original pieces over at the Student Center at the Shack. Uh, in 1950, Gus Ridgell became, we am I saying that right? I always feel like that. Ridgell. I always say Ridgell and it's Ridgell. Uh, was the first black student admitted who attended the university. So uh, more than 14 years after Lloyd Gaines was originally supposedly allowed to enroll in the university. Um, was granted the admission to our graduate program because it was not available at Lincoln University in Jeff City. He earned his master's degree in economics with honors in 1951, and in 96, we awarded him an honorary doctorate of science. Uh, he was a longtime professor of economics at Western Kentucky, uh, Western Kentucky, or Kentucky State, not Western Kentucky. Um, and is a really, really nice man. If you ever get the chance to meet him, I really recommend spending a few minutes talking. Uh, in 1953, KOMU went on the air, and it's still the only university-owned commercial network affiliate in the country. In 1955, the Missouri Student, which was the student newspaper at the time, changed its name to the Man Eater. And in 19... It's right around that time. I don't remember specifically what year. It's 53 to 55, somewhere in there. The first TV was introduced on campus, and it had an 8-inch screen. It was over in Neff Auditorium, so it was, a, it was a really big deal to get that. In 1954, we had our first uh, team national championship. Uh, that was the baseball team. And in 65, the indoor track and field team won a national championship as well. We've had several individual athletes, both in track and field and wrestling, win national titles along the way, but those are our uh, two national champion teams. In 1963, the UN system uh, came around with campuses in Columbia, Kansas City, Rolla, and St. Louis. Um, all are still members today. In 1966, our research reactor opened, which was really groundbreaking. It's the largest nuclear reactor at the university, and it's also one of the biggest producers of cancer-fighting drugs in the country to this day. Uh, Norm Stewart. Uh, who was who the, the courts of both the Hearn Center and the Sewer Arena named for, began coaching in 1967. He finished with 735 wins, which is 
uh, 16th most in D1 history. Uh, in college, he was a multi-sport athlete, but he was uh, All-American in basketball and a national champion uh, baseball player. Was drafted by the Hawks and the Orioles. Um, neither career worked out, so we ended up coming back here and coaching here at one time. And he's another one, if you ever get the chance to, uh, to listen and speak, he's got about a million stories, and they're all really entertaining. Uh, student leadership, the Legion of Black Legions was formed in uh, 1968. Uh, Deputy Chancellor Mike Middleton and his wife Julie, who are both here at the University of Snow, were some of the founding members. In 1969, they had about 100 members. Um, this is one of the early shots. This was a couple years afterward. This is one of the earlier pictures of the groups. Um, but one of their, their they had several goals to hire both faculty members, uh, to get equal treatment on campus, things like that. Um, so one of the first professors who was hired in, in order to meet some of those demands was Arbor Strickland. In 1969, he was our first full-time black faculty member. He founded the Black Studies Program, which was used as a model at a lot of universities across the country. He was also a, sort of a nationally renowned historian, and he was also a very fierce advocate for higher education. Um, the General Classrooms Building, old GCB, if you hear uh, alumni refer to that at all, they'll ask about GCB. It was the General Classrooms Building, but it was renamed Strickland Hall in his honor in 2007. And there's a really cute picture of him with Jabari uh, at the dedication of that uh, online if you ever get a chance to look at that. In the 1970, uh, students were upset with the killing of six students at Kent State. Uh, there were riots across the country and a lot of places were uh, roughed up a lot worse than the zoo, but students uh, swarmed Chancellor Schwada's office and for a short time took over campus. Um, they camped out on the quad. Um, as you can kind of see here, they got pretty comfortable out there. Um, McAllister Park, which is where Peace Park is now, was renamed Peace Park following these events. And the bridge over there, it's not like marrying an engineer, but you're destined to fall in love if you walk across it with a sweetheart. Wait, where is Peace Park? Peace Park is down at 6th and L, uh, right downtown. Um, it's over, like, right by the Missourian, by the J School, uh, just north of the quad, it's by Bengals. Uh, that helps some people. Different landmarks are different. In 1972, the Hearn Center opened, and it was named for former Governor Warren Hearns. This is a picture of him at one of our homecomings, crowning uh, Janine Sugarbaker. The first entertainer to perform at the Hearn Center was Bob Hope, uh, and it, it housed all of our indoor sports, track and field, wrestling, gymnastics, basketball, everything for a while. Uh, in 1971, we taught our first women's study course. And in 1974, the Women's Center opened on campus. Uh, I don't know if any of you know Kim Dude, who's the director of the Wellness Resource Center, but she was in this picture. In 1978, Barb Ewing became the Zeus third chancellor uh, after they switched to chancellor from president and became the first woman to lead a major state university in the country. And she was behind a lot of the campus beautification efforts. Um, over the decades between World War II and when she took over that 30-year span, um, the growth just kind of went unchecked and people threw up everything wherever. She kind of brought a strategic vision to the campus and beautified a lot of it uh, after the fact. In 1981 to 84, they took Lowry Mall. They created Lowry Mall from what was Lowry Street. Um, this was when it was a road people could kind of park here, just drove right up to the bookstore, uh, to the fine arts building of the library. You could just drive through there and they eventually closed that off to make it a little safer for pedestrians. In 1995, the university celebrated the 100th anniversary of the Frank Quadrangle uh, being fully constructed and it's, as you guys know, being uh, kind of refurbished right now, but it will be back online hopefully soon. Most of the buildings will be soon. Uh, we were really big in a lot of technology advancements in the late 90s. Uh, James Ferguson was the inventor of LCD technology, so uh, phones, televisions, uh, things like that. He was the creator of that technology and was inducted into the National Inventors Hall of Fame. 
1999, uh, Jerry Atwood, Leonard Barber, and William Ward uh, received international acclaim for their work with molecular science. If you hear like about smart drugs in the news at all, uh, they were very central in the creation of smart drugs. And Jerry Atwood is still on faculty here, but I do not believe the other two still work here. Uh, and the, the 2000s was a really kind of big decade as far as including all of our students uh, equal treatment wise. In 2003, sexual orientation was added to our non-discrimination statement. In 2005, the LGBTQ Resource Center opened in the basement of Brady Commons. Uh, in 2013, we began providing domestic partner benefits for all couples. And in 2014, gender identity and expression were added to our non-discrimination statement. So we've, we've been a little behind the national trend as far as universities, but as a society as a whole, we're still ahead of the curve. And this is one of the, the pride parades through campus. Uh, our Billion Dollar Campaign was first completed in 2008. Uh, we've got a new campaign kicking off this fall, so it's something you should probably look out for. I don't think they have a, a finalized slogan for it still, so if you have any good ideas, be sure to let uh, development now because they would appreciate it. Um, in 2010, ESPN Game Day made its first appearance in Mizzou. We were taken on Oklahoma and beat them. And it was uh, the biggest attended game day, and it still might be, although they don't ever have official numbers, it's estimated to be the largest attended game day ever. Um, this is what the quad looked like. It's just packed with people from the columns all the way up to the, the circle drive. And this is the, the field after everybody stormed it afterwards. Uh, in 2012, we joined the SEC officially. Um, people might ask you about joining the Big Ten. They did have an offer out to us uh, to be a partial member, but we wouldn't receive full funding for about five years. Um, after becoming a member, and because we balked at the terms, they invited Nebraska, who accepted on those terms. And that's why Nebraska went, and we ended up in the SEC, and we ended up probably better off for it. So. In 2014, uh, we had a couple milestones. Uh, Chancellor Lofton became our 22nd Chancellor overall, and we celebrated our 175th year. We just wrapped that up last week, I guess, a week ago. It's been a busy year. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's, that's a few of the events. It was a good time. Um, if you want more information or photos of anything historic, a lot of this is online at missouri.edu backslash timeline. And you can also email me at any time. I get back to people pretty quickly. If I know the answer, I can try to track it down for you if I don't. Yeah. They were, they were in the 18, 1890, I think, was the first international student movement. From China? I think so. Because the Chinese lines came for the journalism school not too long after, after their ambassadors came to visit our university. Yeah, I'll, I'll look that up. Yeah? I should be said this, but who won the game of our first homecoming game? We did beat Kansas. Okay. So don't worry about it. <laughs> that was one that we did. We did win. Was it? We didn't lose. <laughs> I need to look that up. Okay. Okay. Do you guys have any other questions for Ryan? Yeah. I'm not necessarily the answer. I'm just curious about like things that are going on here. 